Okay, thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, the session is being offered um, from Atkins Library through partnership with the Center for Teaching and Learning on open educational resources. Today's topic is Affordable Textbooks by Atkins Library. Our presenters today are Jeff McAdams, the Engineering Librarian, and Liz Seiler, the Interim Associate Dean for Collection Services. Jeff and Liz, thank you so much for offering this webinar. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Jules. Um, so, uh, Liz and I work together to, to um, provide outreach and advocacy for um, affordable textbooks, and we'll go over um, how, how we do that. But the first thing we want to talk about is the need for affordable textbooks. So um, I'm, I'm going to show you the first slide, which is uh, um, a, a graph. Um, using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that tracks the increase in textbook prices over the last um, 40 years, essentially 35, 40 years. And um, textbook price increase has, um, you know, risen more than any other consumer good actually, um, including um, the healthcare costs in, in the United States. Um, the, the, CPI line is the consumer price index, which is the standard of inflation. So um, textbooks, when people think about textbooks when they went to college, um, a lot of parents will think about that. Um, they know they're expensive, but they're, they're, they're way more expensive as a relation to other goods that people can buy today than they were like when I went to college or when you know uh, older people went to college. So, it's important to understand that um, textbook classes are have an outsized impact on students um, currently. Um, we want to talk about the barriers to student success regarding textbooks. Um, so one of the first things that's a, a barrier is having access on day one. And, and I know that uh, a lot of students try to purchase their textbooks um, at the last minute, right? You know, they, they, they trying to schedule their um, classes to see which class they want and they don't wanna buy the textbook if they're not gonna be in the class or um, they're gonna see if they really need the, the textbook. A lot of students will tell us that um, in some interviews we've done with them is to say, I, I, I've been burned before, like a student or a professor asked me to buy a book and then we didn't really use it that much in class. so they will try to see like, when do I need to actually buy the book? Is it actually something I need? And, and if it is something they actually need, often they get it too late, you know, and they'll miss, um, you know, the first assignment or first two assignments will try to borrow from a friend and, you know, it just doesn't work out that way. The library copy isn't enough for everybody. Often the library doesn't even have a copy of the textbook because it's, it's almost impossible for us to keep track of uh, what's um, being required in, in uh, different courses, um, you know, getting new editions. It, it's also super expensive for us to do that. Um, so even if we do have a copy, you know, and even if that copy is on reserve for let's say two hours, it's still not enough for everybody to, to, um, to access. Financial stress and food insecurity is a is a is kind of a hidden hidden thing among people on campus. We do have a food pantry on campus. Um, there's over a thousand food pantries in the United States on different campuses. Um, more and more students are food insecure or report, or report food food insecurity. The financial stress on students beyond just their tuition. Um, costs, they have, you know, living expenses, and it's not the same for all the students where it's like we think of a traditional student as getting, you know, um, grants or scholarships and loans and everything is taken care of. A lot, a lot of students have to work um, during college, which is itself a barrier to student success. And um, starting the semester behind others, if they don't have access to the materials, um, 
they won't they'll be on uh, like the the wrong foot you know so to speak and they won't be able to um prepare as well for the rest of the semester uh, the last link i have here is an equity issue that's a um a link to a um a research article a scholarly research article that was done in 2018 um, in Georgia, it was a longitudinal study about um, OERs um, in class in classrooms uh, being the the effectiveness of them and how if uh, a student who is a, a you know lower socioeconomic group um, is in a class with uh, that uses an OER they do uh, dramatically better than the other students. Um, and what it means is, I'm sorry, it, not better, but like they, 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 um, that they do, they do better than they, they would have. So let's say that you have a class of, um, you know, students and the poor students, uh, don't have access to a book, they're going to do worse. But if everybody has equal access to a, a, a free copy of, a, of an OER, um, the, the poor students do well and the, and the richer privileged, privileged students do well. So it's a kind of an equalizer for, for a class. The, the people who stand to benefit the most um, from implementing an OER are the lower socioeconomic students. There was a, a student survey that was done last September. Um, it was a national uh, survey done by the um, US Public Interest Research Group. It's an organization that um, advocates for students. They surveyed 82 universities. They got 5,823 responses. And they found that 65% of the students didn't buy at least one textbook due to the cost, even though they were concerned about not buying it would impact their grade um, at some level. 21% didn't buy the access code and access code is often an online, a publisher will sell online access through a, you know, through a code um, which allows students to um, do interactive quizzes or to submit their homework for automated grading or other things like that. Um, so 21% people didn't buy an access code, that means they couldn't participate in the homework or quizzes, which would definitely affect their grade. 79% um, reported that they were impacted negatively by COVID um, and beyond just staying at home, it, it meant like they were like impacted in a negative way through like financially or, or with their health. Um, and 10% reported a lack of reliable internet access, which means they couldn't participate in like Zoom calls or, um, you know, get access to all the information they needed from the class. And another 10% reported food insecurity. But of those 10% that reported food insecurity, which is actually an alarmingly high number, 82% um, didn't buy a textbook and 38% didn't buy an access code. So that's a lot more than um, the normal group of people who didn't report. And um, this kind of is a, a point that I would like to make is that, you know, the affordability of textbooks, it, it, it's, a, it's a really big issue for most students, but for, you know, a smaller number of students, it is the biggest issue. You know, this is like, they may not be able to go to school because of it. They may have to drop out because of this thing. So there's there's a number of students and classes on this campus that um, if they had an OER, they could continue with their studies. You know, they, this, this makes a big difference for some people. Um, a few years ago, uh, we had, uh, you know, interviewed some students and we had them fill out a whiteboard um, in the library for a few, for a week. Um, we also asked them how much their, their um, textbooks cost. Some of the comments were really ad addressing access codes and they were, they were just kind of outraged a little bit about how, how expensive access codes are. And um, you can see in the comments down here, they're just, they're, 
you know, I know it's hard to, uh, you know, understand the minds of students, but that, like they really, they really do think like, you know, the, the, the textbooks and the access, access code specifically are, are um, unfair, I, I suppose that's, that's the best way to say it. Um, we asked them to say, how much um, do your textbooks cost? And, and if you notice on the left side of this um, image, there's, we didn't ask, we, we, the lowest number we put was 100, but somebody put zero and a lot of people put it in there. And they said, just look online. And what that means is that they are, uh, are saying like, oh, you know, basically they're pirating uh, material. They're going just, you know, to certain websites to, to find PDF copies of, uh, of their textbooks illegally. And, you know, we in the library really feel strongly that we shouldn't put students in a position where they, they feel like they need to do that risky behavior. Um, and one of the comments underneath of that was saying interactive textbooks and access codes can't find for free online because um, the publishers have really, you know, clamped down on that. Um, although, you know, that's, <laughs> that's changing all the time. Um, and then another thing is like, uh, these are some of the, the um, further comments from the students saying that, you know, you know, use Canvas better um, by older editions, trying to do other things to, to help them save money. Now we know a lot of instructors do whatever they can to help save the students money. And uh, sometimes, you know, even through good intentions, there's some bad consequences. But um, what we're trying to do here is talk about OERs as a solution to that. So enough of the doom and gloom. Um, we did an OER, well, we, what we call an affordable textbook um, uh, pilot program. And we had uh, seven courses where uh, we were able to give them a no cost solution. Um, and we did a, a pilot survey uh, of this and it said the average amount of the students they spent on each uh, textbook each semester was $331. And when the students had a no cost um, solution that the teacher provided, which was either an OER or a library, um, pro library provided um, text, the students were all highly satisfied with the quality of the material. They appreciated the cost savings and the easy access to the materials. And we asked them, you know, uh, what did they do? The last bullet point is like, we asked them, what, what did they do to try to save money on, on textbooks? And they say they typically um, rent materials, um, but they don't use them as, as much as they um, think that they, sh they should to, um, for the price of them. Um, but a lot of cases they choose just not to purchase the book at all. So some of the quotes, they said they were immediately be able, they were able to immediately use the textbook without stress and, um, and there was no excuse not to do the work um, from day one because they had access to the resources. And um, they said they were able to obtain more information reading the important pieces of the textbook that was given to us online. We learned better and the important information stuck with us better. So access to the information is, I mean, it's such an obvious um, um, thing, but it's like a key to learning. If they don't have access to the information, um, they won't be able to do as well in the class. Um, so, I want to talk about OER benefits to faculty. OER gives you permissions up front. And OER resource is basically defined as something with um, a CC license, a Creative Commons license, where you're able to um, retain something, which means you can keep it forever. It means you can uh, reuse it and use it for different purposes. It means you can remix it. It means you can edit it. Um, so they give you all these permissions up front with these Creative Commons licenses. 
so you know what you can do with these resources rather than a full all rights reserved copyright license that most of the traditional textbook publishers put on their materials. Um, if you wanted to do anything, you would have to email the um, publishing company to see if you could use it and you know beg permission. Um, but this one, you you know exactly what you can do with these resources. Um, you have all that information up front. You can share links or files. So let's say a student um, didn't have uh, great email or, or email internet access all all the time. Um, you could put a, a a PDF of of the of the OER on your Canvas page. You know, you're not breaking copyright by doing that. And the student can come into the library, download the PDF um, using our Wi-Fi, and then they can have that and they don't have to use the internet, you know, and you know, they can read it whenever they want because they have the file. Um, you can update or edit uh, these uh, OERs as needed. So Let's say that you found a great OER, but it was published in 2015, and there's some really, um, you know, salient and pertinent, pertinent new re, uh, developments in your field um, in the last five years or six years. Um, you can add those to the OER. You don't have to rewrite the whole thing. You can just add a, um, you know, a section to the uh, to the OER. Um, you can update some uh, some paragraphs if you need to. You know, you can edit the text because you've got that permission up front to do that. Um, these are free to use to students and the faculty, but also to anybody in the world, really. So they're free um, to. You can use them for lots of different purposes. Um, you can use them for community engagement, and and um, uh, there's there's. There's just there's a lot of barriers that are removed with that. Um, some uh, benefits of this, um, another benefit of this is students can engage and participate in developing revisions or new works, which sometimes, um, uh, you know, faculty can use in an open pedagogy where, where they'll, they'll have a student, like for example, there was a, a, a class that was um, using uh, a textbook, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the title all of a sudden. Um, it was project management, uh, a textbook, an OER for project management, but they wanted to have it specifically related for instructional design. Um, so that it was a it was a upper level uh, course. Uh, and what they did was they said, let's take this uh, OER textbook on project management and let's let's customize it for instructional design courses. And so what they did was they they created a bunch of examples and and um, kind of reworded and and um, reworked the text a little bit um, so that the textbook was more uh, easily used for the students in that class. So that was a great way for students to engage in the text. Um, they had a lot of experience uh, with peer review and with you know understanding you know professional writing and. All of those things. So there's a it was a lot of authentic learning that was available because they had those permissions of the Creative Commons licenses to um, to use that textbook. So that was just a, a great creative way that they can use that. Um, so some OER examples. Uh, you can find lots of traditional textbooks that are, are that are available as an as an OER. Um, OpenStax uh, out of Rice University is is a kind of a leader in that. They have a lot of a lot of textbooks for the for the gen ed course series you know so like anthropology and sociology anatomy and physiology calculus algebra biology etc and so those are kind of like traditional textbooks they're usually one or two semester um replacements of a traditional textbook so like of you know of, of a pearson textbook or a mcgraw hill textbook for example um, so they'll have uh, they're you know um, they have a lot of um, the same features and they'll have they'll even have um, ancillary materials such as you know PowerPoint slides and quizzes for instructors to use. Um, so they're meant to be a replacement for the lower level gen ed course materials. 
um, they are free and you know it's Creative Commons license. So um, those are kind of easy replacements, even if you need to adapt them or edit them a little bit. Um, there's also the, like a reader or an, an anthology. So I've seen um, some of these examples where an instructor, instead of writing a whole textbook, what they've used is um, public domain or open access materials. And they've put in some, you know, some context, like maybe a, a page or two of context with some um, thoughtful, critical thinking questions posed to the students. And then they'll use um, a text like, a, for example, there was um, an ancient history, one of these where they used um, public domain translations of uh, like Roman um, uh, um, what am I? <laughs> uh, primary source materials um, from you know like the 200 AD or something like that to talk about specific you know aspects of Roman culture. And then there's another one recently that was a, a, a an anthology or a reader on uh, climate change and resiliency and climate change where they used a bunch of open access articles and did the same thing where they had a page or two of context and questions and then they kind of had a um, you know a narrative of that so that was another example of how um, people are using OERs and using open materials and another thing is um, we've had some people develop course shells some universities and university systems. In fact, the um, UNC system last summer developed 13 course shells. What they'll use is a, um, OER texts, um, OER videos or open access videos, and um, they've created assignments. So what they've done is they've not just used a, a textbook, but they've, they've, they've um, used what in the faculty with um, collaboration with instructional designers have created, um, you know, learning outcomes, and they've created a, a whole course shell of 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 an open access or an op open educational um, course where you, uh, as faculty, can take, you know, whatever you need from that and adapt it to your own course without having to do a lot of that heavy lifting that you've already done. So those are some examples of how. Um, OERs can benefit you or your class. Now they don't exist, you know, in every class. Like there are, aren't um, examples for every type of class um, that we offer. So there may be some classes um, that, that there's not material for, but a lot of classes and more and more people are creating OERs. So a lot of classes do have uh, at least even a partial solution um, using an OER. All right, so Liz, I'm gonna pass it over to you if you'd like. Yes, so um, just like Jeff just said, sometimes there's not an OER for everything. Um, so if you'd like to still provide um, no cost resources to your students for uh, course, assigned, course assignments and course assigned readings, you can use library resources. Um, all of the eBooks we buy are unlimited simultaneous user access. They never expire. So you can use them for as long as you would like in your class. And the students can download and keep a DRM free copy forever. So it's, um, they, can, they can have that copy for as long as they'd like it. Um, I do wanna mention though, that there are books in our catalog that um, do um, expire and, and do have DRM on them. They are the uh, ebook ProQuest Central NC Live books. So I would encourage you if you're going to choose a book that the library owns to make sure if it's one of those books to check with us first to see if we can get a copy that we would be able to own. Um, and if you have any issues with the DRM, because the DRM generally means that it's there's some restrictions on printing or um, downloading. Um, although sometimes that's not a problem, especially if you're just assigning a chapter or if they're only reading a chapter in time, then it shouldn't necessarily be a problem. Um, we also can provide uh, multimedia and vi uh, video content. So like, for example, we have a program called Primal Pictures that is used in anatomy and, it, and it's a really good program to be able to just kind of go through the, you know, the body. Um, and then um, we have a lot of streaming video content that we either already subscribe to or can, um, can subscribe to. Now the video content is really only a lease, we can't purchase it, but if it's something that you wanted to use in your class at some point, we can make that available. 
um, barring any funding issues. Um, we have a lot of primary source materials in databases and collections that can be used as course materials in your classes. And you can do direct linking from uh, those materials in Canvas um, so that it's part of your, it's part of your um, Canvas box. It's part of the box of the class. So it's, there's everything that you need in one place. Um, um, so yeah, we have lots of different resources that can be used in a class in place of a um, traditional textbook. Um, they don't have the features that an OER does in terms of the ability to edit or change or anything like that, but they can still be useful. And of course, there's always articles that you can use as well. I know um, a lot of uh, classes use those as well. So the idea being that instead of assigning a textbook, you can just assign multi lots of different pieces um, from the library that could be um, incorporated into the class and the, um, the students will be able to use them as they need. Next slide, yeah, there we go. So how can we help you in your journey towards um, affordable, providing affordable textbooks? Um, we have what's called the e-textbook database, and that's a database of titles that we um, either own or we can purchase that you can select and request titles and we can, um, we can get those for you. You can also search our library catalog. All of the books that we own are in there. Like I said, you know, beware a little bit of the um, ProQuest titles that we get through NC Live. Um, but otherwise you can identify anything else you would like to use within our library catalog. Um, and you don't really have to tell us, although if you'd like to, we'd, we'd love to know because we do try to track that as much as we can. Um, and then if there's something that you can't find in either of those locations, you can always uh, email um, Atkins eBooks. It, that email address is on the eTextbook database and um, ask, and I'm always happy to go look and see if we can find it. Uh, the other, um, Thing I want to mention is that if you want, there's a form for um, the, there's the textbook database, and then there's also a form for streaming video. If you go to the faculty and staff link at the top of the page on the library website, and then you go to instruction, that will list those links for those two um, uh, resources that you can use. We also have an OER guide, which is one of our LibGuides, and that has all sorts of information about where you can find OERs, where you can search for them, um, and and kind of takes you out into the web on you know, reputable sites so that you can identify the OERs that will work best for you. Um, we also do um, have open textbook publishing and open educational re uh, resources depository. The open textbook publishing is part of our digital publishing program. So if you wanted to conceivably publish a textbook with all of your information, information you would be teaching in your class, we could do that for you. Um, we also have a place where if you are creating open educational resources that you would like to make available to other places, we can put that in our um, institutional repository, Niner Commons, and um, that can be made available openly and, and also can, you know, be part of your portfolio in terms of um, possibly tenure and promotion and things like that. We can put that as part of your, um, uh, your uh, presence in uh, Niner Commons. Um, and, and Liz, I just wanted... Yeah, uh, Go ahead. mention real quick. So we and, and when you're looking for these materials, whether it's a library material or an OER material, um, you know, we have the links here for you, but I don't want you to feel like you have to do this on your own. Um, the subject librarians in your area and I um, would be happy to help you with that. So, you know, email your subject specialist and if you're looking for, you know, um, some alternatives for you know, text for your classes and, and we'll help you traverse, you know, like finding the materials. That's what librarians are really good at. So um, we don't want you to feel like you have to try it and, and, and spend a lot of time trying it before you contact us. Please just let us know and we'd be happy to help you get you started on that. Yes, thank you. Um, and then on, of course, you know, what we want to know too is like, what else can we do to help? What do you need our help with? And, um, you know, like Jeff said, you can contact your subject librarian with those answers, or if you want to put something in the chat, that would be helpful as well. Um, but we're, you know, we're still navigating um, what we need to do to um, help um, faculty make this switch that, as Jeff had mentioned at the beginning or said at the beginning of the presentation, is incredibly beneficial for the students. We can move on to the next slide. Yeah. So we are continuing to um, work in our efforts to try to increase the impact of using no cost materials on our campus, trying to work with 
classes that have several sessions and many students or classes that have really high cost materials or no cost um, um, and finding them no cost alternatives. And then also um, we understand why faculty would choose to use an access code. It is It comes with a lot of um, course materials that are useful in the class. So one of the things we've been working on is trying to find a way to help with that. What can we do to replace that access code and not make it too much of an um, effort, at least eventually for the faculty to adopt, to adopt? And it might be some effort on the front end, but that's something that we are uh, aware of being an issue. And it's something that we are trying to come up with um, ideas to address, um, but it, it helps to have partners to that are actually teaching classes to help us with that process. So those are the things that we are wanting to do going forward and we'll continue to work on um, uh, as, we, as we continue this um, effort. So that is the end of the presentation. Um, we are open to questions and... Uh, yeah, and we'd love to have a dialogue with anybody about uh, their thoughts, um, their their frustrations or the things that they've tried or or just any concerns or questions you may have. Thank you so much, Jeff and Liz. That was a great presentation. We don't have any questions in the chat, but we do have such a small group that I think that we could invite people to unmute and to start a conversation or to ask any questions they may have. So I will just invite anyone who wants to speak or ask a question to go ahead and unmute. Uh, hey guys, this is Jamie Brandon. I'm with the nursing department and I wanted to say I really appreciated your presentation. I think from my viewpoint as a faculty member, just observing um, students and one of the struggles that I think or issues that I think is common to them, you mentioned, which was a financial impact and food insecurity. I'm seeing more and more of our students that are needing to work um, you know, 40 hour weeks to support themselves to get through school. So I, I really see this is as um, being very important and something that would help students cross the board, especially uh, when it comes to the equity issue that you raised. So for me, um, I would be very interested in finding something that I could use for a community health nursing course, which is what I teach population focused nursing that has more relevance um, to what's going on in today's because public health changes so quickly and so rapidly. And a lot of times what's in our textbook is already outdated by the time students get to me. So I think something of this would have a bigger impact and would be more helpful from a content value and then also from equity, as you mentioned. So um, I'm very interested in it. And I appreciate you having this workshop today. Thanks a lot. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've emailed Beth Otten. She's our uh, librarian for, for your college. She's, um, you know, just real fantastic about um, helping people find resources. Um, there may not be like a traditional textbook that, you know, like you said, because, you know, the information gets outdated so quickly. So, it, you know, a, a, a good alternative may just be finding um, open access articles or um, other types of resources that are, you know, openly available, like, uh, you know, from institutional websites or something like that, that, that you could you know, cobbled together into like a, you know, a, 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 you know, curated resource or something like that. And Beth could definitely help you find those um, individual kind of resources. So um, I think this is a, one of the things that a lot of faculty um, struggle with is like, you know, publishers will, you know, offer them um, like a real package solution. Um, and that's kind of, sometimes what we have in the back of our heads of is like, this has to be the solution to my class because this is what people have always done. So, so I appreciate you being open-minded and, uh, and you know, looking out for the students. This is, uh, like you said, uh, um, even if you, you know, this is an equity issue, we want all the students in our class to succeed. So, um, you know, 
even if um, these materials can't replace um, a traditional textbook, we can give them some alternatives. Um, for example, one of the engineering professors who um, did our pilot grant, he, he took his old textbook and he didn't have it, um, he didn't replace it necessarily. He just said it was, it was recommended instead of required. And what he did was he took a bunch of uh, different uh, ebooks and other resources that we found for him that the, the library could provide. And he kind of made it to say like, I recommend this textbook, but I understand if you can't afford it, um, here are some other resources that you can use. And he made it so that they didn't have to use the textbook for their tests or quizzes. You know, he was doing a class that was, you know, um, not super dependent on the textbook. So um, he, he, he realized that like, you know, even though he preferred it, he wanted to make options available for students who didn't take it. And he said, you know, probably about 25% um, of the class didn't buy the traditional textbook, which kind of tracks with a lot of people who can't afford it. So, um, so I, we appreciate those efforts whenever they can. So these are conversations, like it's not an all or nothing thing that we want faculty to, to say like, you know, um, you know, we're trying to save students money, but what we're really trying to do is to make sure students are successful and there's lots of options for that. So we appreciate you being here and, and, and that.